community as well. Um, <coughs> we have uh, today, we have uh, Quinn Norton, who's going to give us a, a talk. Um, Quinn is a journalist and has written numerous articles about uh, hacker culture, data security, network communications, and the internet in general. Um, she was Wired Magazine's embedded reporter covering the Occupy movement, covering stories in Oakland and San Francisco, and Washington, D.C., and Boston and New York City. Um, I get them all. I'm not sure. I you went to 14 all, camps. 14 so in Occupy camps. Dot, 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 more. Yes, plus, <laughs> plus more. Um, <coughs> Writings appear frequently in The Message, a column on the Medium website. Um, and just to give you a little taste of some of the things that you can see there if you haven't read them, um, she wrote back in August, she wrote an article called Ahizma Online. And in that article, she reminds us that the internet is made of people. And the internet only gets better if we get better. Um, so I want to thank uh, Digital Liberal Arts for making it possible for Quinn Norton to be here. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to her to tell us a bit about Seeing Like a Network. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, I'll, uh, I'll try not to be too loud. We've got a loud mic here. <laughs> All right. So, uh, Seeing Like a Network. Uh, one of the things you'll notice in this talk is that I have a lot of images in here that have come up when I've Google image searched for awesome. <laughs> okay, and, and this is our first one, uh, which is Darth Vader and a shark high-fiving <laughs> while other things happen. Anyway, um, I, and I want to talk, start by talking to you about this amazing age we live in and how wonderful and awesome it really is. Um, when I was a kid, and some of you that will remember this, and some of you will be amazed by it. We had to argue over facts, <laughs> right? Like, like you have an argument with somebody about the date something happened, as opposed to going, wait, 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 I have all of human knowledge in my pocket. <laughs> Let me just look that up. Now you basically have to go out into the tundra or on a cheap flight in, a, in order to have an argument about facts. You just can't do it anymore the way we used to. Um, yeah, seriously, like, if I wanted to find all the major battles that were in War and Peace uh, when I was a kid, I'd be like, I'm taking two hours off next week and going to the library. If I can't get it within a minute right now, I'm like, what's wrong with the world? <laughs> so our expectations have changed a great deal. Um, in fact, like, right now, if I wanted to talk to thousands of people this instant, I would take out my phone and pull up my Twitter client. If I wanted to talk to thousands of people as a kid, I had to make a career choice and then diligently follow that for years. Um, and I think it's worthwhile to note, we don't know exactly how to live in this world yet. This is a brand new world that we're in. Right now I could decide that I wanted to watch, or I wanted to read War and Peace on my phone because I, for some reason, thought it was a great idea on a three-inch screen. And then five minutes later, I could give up on that and just have volunteers read it to me, which I did. <laughs> um, and, uh, and they've actually read that to, I don't know how many people, but any arbitrary number of people. So thank you, LibriVox volunteers, for reading War and Peace to me and, and <coughs> other people. So I call this place that we're living in, this strange world where I can do all these magical things, the invisible city. And we, uh, we think of like one of the last great human migrations as when we moved from the country to the city. And we did that over the 19th and 20th century. And in that process, we all had to learn new norms. Like how to pretend we can't hear everyone else in a cafe so that we're not creepy. Uh, that it's wrong to look in people's windows because that's creepy. Creepy is going to come up a lot as we learn to adapt to new spaces. How to not be a jerk when you're trying to coexist with millions of people. Do you think we knew that the moment we moved from small town world to city world? No, we had to invent these norms. And in the same way, one of the great projects of the 21st century is going to be inventing norms for the invisible city that we all moved into almost at the same time, you know, civilizationally speaking. And right now, 
It's an invisible city. We don't even know how to cross the road safely. But we can learn it. We can figure out its rhythms. We can understand it. We can use it. We can learn to inhabit this city in a way where we enrich it and it enriches us. Because that was kind of the point of moving to cities in the first place. Whittier College's Wi-Fi really wants me to log in. <laughs> but we are making ourselves as we go along, and sometimes what I really, really wish is that we had like an anthropologist, an alien anthropologist that could come down and explain our lives to us right now. But as it turns out, all of the alien anthropologists live in the future. Um, so here's how I think we imagine the network right now. Here's kind of what we're afraid the network really is. <laughs> This is how the, the government sees the network. And this is legit just an email I got one day and is still one of my favorite things. This is pretty much how the internet looks in my head. <laughs> and this is what the internet looks like to most people. <laughs> um, this is how we view things and, I, and really I am the trust me, I know the internet's person. Um, and I didn't have that exact computer. I had a TI 94A. <laughs> but I'm that dork, right? <laughs> um, and this was really fun and charming in the early 90s, but it's over. And this can't be how we look at the at internet and technology anymore. It's not okay thinking we can, it's like imagining that you can have a college, but we'll go ahead and go back to the era of scribes and everybody should not bother learning how to read and write. Obviously, that's not going to work. And so this is something of a digital security training. This is something of a lecture. But it's also something of an evangelical position for me. So I'm going to give you a bunch of information today. And I want you to kind of take it out into the world. I want you to tell other people that we should be worried about learning this network and getting to it. And not just because it's scary, but also because it's awesome. But we need to start spreading this digital literacy. There was a point at which a few years ago, some activists said to Congress, it's not okay to not know how the internet works anymore. And I'm going to come back and say that to you. It's not okay to not understand how network <coughs> life works anymore. In the same exact way, and it's not okay to try and be illiterate in modern life. We don't want to blame people who haven't gotten the education, but we want to make damn sure they get it. So, What's happening right now is not great. Um, we're not making good choices. When we understand where our information is, when we understand how the network works, we'll make better choices. Uh, so, by the way, I wanted to kind of bring up a reference to um, Jaylon Reddit for this talk, and uh, I did not Google, I would like you to know. I did not actually want to see Jaylon nude when I did this. <laughs> Google had other ideas. <laughs> I apologize, Ms. Jennifer Lawrence. It was not on purpose. <laughs> um, but it's really, really important that we understand where our data is and what our data is. And we'll be getting um, a little bit more into that shortly. When we learn to be responsible citizens of this invisible city and we make informed decisions, we will gain wonderful powers. But right now, more than anything, we need to learn how it works. So, you guys are seated comfortably? Yeah? All right, I need about 10 of you to get back up. Stand up if you want to uh, volunteer yourself. <laughs> Don't make me call on you. <laughs> okay, come on up. Come on up. Okay, I need a few more, or I'm, I'm going to start calling on people. The more uncomfortable you look, the more likely I am to call on you. <laughs> All right, these are cell phone towers. I need a few more cell phone towers. Who wants, who's always wanted to be a cell phone tower? <laughs> All right, I need two more people to be cell phone towers. One more, one more. I'm gonna, I'm gonna call, so I'll do it. Okay. <laughs> Don't worry, because now I need two cell phones. <laughs> <laughs> I saw I saw you there. <laughs> now I'm calling you up. So unless somebody else, anyone, anyone, come on. Yeah, you need a couple cell phones. Don't worry, 
You just walk around and say one thing. Okay. <laughs> All right. So these are our two cell phones. Cell phone towers. I, your, t your coverage is terrible. Yes. Yeah, I need you to spread around the room a little bit. Okay. And cell phones. All right. I need you on either end of the room. So one of you stay here. The other one head back to kind of the middle area back there. Um, cell phone towers, you're, again, you need to be in the middle, too. <laughs> this is a dead zone. <laughs> All right, so, um, cell phone, go ahead and back up a little bit more, cell phone. We're going to play a game called Marco Polo is a Very Interesting Historical Figure. <laughs> oh, man, we don't have enough cell phone towers. Come okay, on. <laughs> you know you've always wanted to be a cell phone tower. <laughs> You're, you're lucky. Sometimes I make everyone do this game. All right, all right. Well, we'll have very bad coverage, guys. You hate it when this happens. <laughs> all right. So what we're going to do, and this is actually how your cell phones work, is every, usually in most networks, every three seconds, <laughs> your cell phone goes along and it says the digital equivalent of where am I? And then three towers minimum respond. Um, and those three towers respond in the order of who's closest to furthest away. So the way we're going to represent that is that the closest tower is going to say Marco, the second closest tower is going to say Polo, and the third closest tower is going to say is a very interesting historical figure. <laughs> Do we got that? Okay. So, cell phones, I want you to walk together, take a few steps. Oh, you're, you're, you're actually meeting up, so go ahead and walk towards each other. Stop. Now you ask where you go. Both ask where am I? Where am I? Marco. Polo. Very interesting. <laughs> and this kind of tower fight does happen, by the way. Um, and for you? Marco. Polo. I think you're a historical figure. Okay. Okay. So, <laughs> so it's Marco Polo is a very interesting historical figure. Now, when you look at the three towers in both of these situations, their signal is described by a circle around them. And if you look at these three, especially up here in front, that was very fortuitous. If you look at the circle, there's really only one place this, this cell phone can be. That it's where those three circles overlap like a Venn diagram. And it takes three, and that's why we call it, does anyone know what we call it? Triangulation, exactly. So cell phones, walk together. Stop. Can you say, where am I? Marco. It's, it's a reluctant tower, and I get it. I, I get the reluctant tower. Um, so right now we're seeing, now what we've established is not only a point, but path data. Okay, so let's do it one more time. Cell phones meet up. Now, go ahead and start walking away in the same direction. So you have to pick the same direction, guys. <laughs> in the same direction as each other. All right, stop. Where am I? Where am I? Marco. Hello. It's a very interesting historical <laughs> figure. Yes. So. Um, now we have the two phones walking together. Go ahead and walk a little bit more, gentlemen. Stop. Where am I? Marco. Paula. Is a very uh, interesting. interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Someday I'll come up with an easier version of this game, <laughs> but not today. So what we have here, I, I want to say thank you very much, cell phones. Thank you very much, towers. Go ahead and have a seat. So what we just saw there is cell phones that came together and then departed somewhere else. Um, now cell phones actually pretty much work the way we described, which means that in order for cell phones to work, they always need to know where you are. And this is a very important point uh, because what we did there is we had two independent people where we knew where they were at all times and then we could see that they were meeting up and moving together. So that actually revealed a huge amount of information about what was going on at that point in just a few cell phone triangulations. However, this wasn't invented for surveillance or nefarious reasons. This is just how radio waves work. 
And in the whole story of the network and surveillance and hacking and so on and so forth, these things are not vulnerable to surveillance because they were set up to surveil you. Surveillance is almost always opportunistically built on the way networks work. And we want them to work this way. There's a certain amount of surveillance, and I like to, I like to riff on Kranzberg's first law here. Surveillance is neither good nor bad, nor is it neutral. There's a certain amount of surveillance we want, especially in cell phone networks, because when we hit a dead zone, we're like, why doesn't this thing work? And that's actually sending a message to our cell phone companies that we want more towers built there. When we, when we have an area with a whole bunch of cell phones in it, that tells them they need to build in more capacity. In some cases, there's transfer of capacity in real time. Like, why put all your bandwidth downtown in the middle of the night when it needs to be at the edges where people are living? So most of the surveillance, actually the most complicated surveillance networks on the planet, most ubiquitous and complicated surveillance networks, are billing systems. Most surveillance was built so that you could pay for things. In fact, when you're dealing with telecommunications, that's the most expensive part of the system as well. The majority of the money that you're paying for your cell phone goes to, infrastructurally, like uh, revenue-wise, not profit-wise, uh, goes to making sure they can bill you for that money. <laughs> hey, capitalism. <laughs> so, oh, that's supposed to be the slide for some. But, so this actually gives you a sense of what you're building over time. This is uh, an iPhone app from a while ago, it's a German user, and it just showed him what the iPhone was telling the towers. And if you were to like zero in on one of those big dots, you'd eventually see path data. And the path data is never exact, it's slightly approximate, um, but it's pretty close. It's probably closer than your memory would be for where you were at any particular time. Um, so when we're talking about networks now, I'm not just talking about the internet. I'm talking about all the networks and the fact that they're overlaying, interconnecting, and touching each other. And I want to go ahead and actually take a moment and ask you guys to name some non-internet networks that you're interacting with. See if you can come up with some interesting ones. Not everyone at once. Postal system. Yeah, a postal network, absolutely. So you put something in, you take things out, it's going through a network. What are some of the other networks that one's interacting with? A oh, road system. Yeah. Uh, various computer systems for routing that. A financial system for paying for it and stamps and that sort of thing. Um, what are some of the other networks you interact with? Sewage. Sewage. Oh my God, thank God for that network. <laughs> yeah, I know we value artists and scientists a lot, but we miss trash people first. Um, I was kind of like, I always want to be like, thank you for your service to a, to a trash collection person. <laughs> <laughs> um, <coughs> what other networks are the sewage networks and, uh, and trash collection and so on and so forth? These networks we're talking about water, yeah, that's an absolutely great service. What else, what else are those interacting with? Electricity, electricity gig, absolutely. Um, and, but we're still thinking very locally, right? Is that, that, um, that water bill, Maybe it's going to your credit card, at which point it's now involved in a global credit system. Um, I think one of the most amazing things about the modern age is right now I could like, be like, screw this and, mock drop and mic drop and go to LAX and fly to Malaysia. And I would not have broken any laws, it would be a dick, but I would not have broken any laws, nor would I have um, stolen anything. I would have merely entered into a series of contracts and that's all based on the fact that they can track my identity, which is amazing. This is great. I mean, I'm not going to mic drop and go to Malaysia, but I could. Um, so this one's pretty important. This is some of the global shipping routes that we're dealing with. Uh, and I'm kind of breaking my own rule because this one is very much on the internet. As a matter of fact, you would be surprised how many things would go away if the internet vanished tomorrow, like your phone calls, which are all basically routed over the internet at this point. Um, 
If you think that you're living offline at any point, you're not. Not if you buy things at stores or have a bank account. You know, I had somebody ask me the other day, is it better for me to deposit a check in person to keep safe from bank fraud or hacking of my bank than it is for me to mail it in or deposit it in the ATM? And I'm like, they just scan it and put it on the internet anyway. <laughs> like it all goes there. Doesn't matter what you do. So right now, while you weren't looking, the world moved on to the internet. So let's get a little bit more novel. There's kind of an important one that you guys haven't named yet that you interact with all the time, like obsessive little monkeys, because we all do these days. <laughs> well, I was gonna go for social media, but that's a little nail on the head there, yes. Yeah, Twitter, Facebook, social networking software. We're just constantly involved with, with those things. Um, uh, but I want to distinguish those from our social networks, which lay on top of all of that. And lay on top of all these networks as well. Our social networks are, again, interacting with these on a whole bunch of different levels. Um, and one that we often don't think about, that I like to point out, um, is our network of laws and how they interact with the, this full stack of different networks that we're talking about. Um, and this is actually, I love this map, this is actually describing, it's probably not readable from where you are, different legal systems as they are used around the world. Uh, civil laws in blue, common laws in red. Um, and so those systems are all going to have influences on each other, especially as they're trying to deal with technological systems, which they are far too slow to deal with. Um, this is one of those magical networks for me. I like the word magic for this because this is one of those networks that has tremendous power until suddenly everybody stops believing in it one day. Like recently everybody stopped believing in Dublin 3, which was the, uh, the asylum measure in Europe. And it's now what they call a dead letter. This is a network that, it's like, again, it's very magical. As soon as laws have tremendous force, unless everybody stops believing them in them about the same time, at which point they have no force. Um, which is also what happened to things like the Soviet bloc collapse. Everybody just stopped believing one day. And, it, and I gotta say, having lived through it, it felt like it was a day. <laughs> it did not feel like it took long. Networks are always um, about, uh, networks are sometimes about passing atoms, I mean to some degree they always are, but what's really important is that networks are about passing information. Networks are always a way of passing information. And if we go back to the very beginning, this is the um, exodus out of Africa that humanity took. What kind of information was this passing around the planet? This DNA, yeah. It's like our original information that we decided to network. Um, and of course networking in this case just becomes a metaphor for how information works in the universe. It's not a bad metaphor. Um, it works on a lot of different levels. Uh, so when we start asking not just what networks look like, but how we look to networks, and then you get back into um, surveillance and care. Because surveillance, in a way, is the fundamental unit of care in a social species, which we are. Um, and this, I don't know if any of you have seen this before, this is a pretty famous map. This is the cholera, John Snow's cholera map, um, by which he was able to map the cholera cases and figure out that they were coming from the water. And that gets into kind of surveillance we really, really want. We want people to collate data and find out what, how our world works so they can help us. So from the, the um, perspective of this road map, um, people look like cases of cholera or nothing. Only cases of cholera are mapped on that. Incidentally, and it's not that visible here, uh, there were no cases of cholera near um, where they were making beer, because everybody's drinking beer all the time instead of well water. <laughs> Moral drink beer in Europe. <laughs> so let's talk about the electrical grid again, real quick. Um, what do you look like to an electrical grid? What does your house look like to an electrical grid? From the perspective of the electrical grid, what does your house look like? To me, the way I would put it is your house looks like a place where energy falls in and money comes out. That's what you are. You're a thing that consumes energy and spits money. It's probably different on a smart grid, but on a dumb grid, which is what you have in Los Angeles, by the way, which is great because 
You can't hack the Los Angeles grid. There's nothing to hack. The only way you could hack LA electrical grid is with an actual ax. <laughs> and they would catch you. <laughs> so, um, uh, <laughs> on this kind of grid though, you just don't have any identity other than like a marker giving like an account number, a way of paying. So like, there's nothing more to you than money comes out of this hole that electricity falls into. We need to make sure the money and the electricity match. Your experience with that may be different, but that's how you look to the network. How do you look to a medical network? I'm actually going to try and get you to say, like, what are some of the, what are some of the ways a medical network sees you? Yeah, yeah, so there's an identification there. Insurance. I'm sorry? Insurance information. Insurance information. Um, yeah, yeah. Illness? Illness, yes. Like, you, you look like a series of diagnoses right. and payment information. Right, right. Um, well, so if we start looking at this aggregated, a lot of that stuff isn't going out on the network. So just think, think in terms of what's actually going out onto a network from there. So, yeah, diagnoses, those are getting reported up because we need that information. If you think you don't like surveillance, I would like to introduce you to, to um, uh, medicine-resistant tuberculosis. Because you will like it in a hurry <laughs> if you don't want your children to catch that. <laughs> um, now, surveillance needs to come with controls, and we'll get into that later. <laughs> but, um, so this is a... So what are some of the things that, that, if you're a hole in this network, what are some of the things that fall into that hole? Medicine, Medicine pills, mm -hmm. time doctors spend, hours of labor fall into that hole, diagnoses come out, payments come out, claims come out, epidemiological data comes out, and that's what you look like. You look like a place where pills fall in and epi epidemiological and data and money comes out. It's, it's kind of weird, but at the same time, you begin to realize that the network paints a picture of you. It's constantly painting little portraits of you. And one of the lessons of the 21st century is learning both what those portraits look like and how to take control of them, both on an individual level and on a societal level. Because right now the network is painting all sorts of pictures and nobody's in charge. Like, nobody is driving this car. We're all in back, and it's going 80 miles an hour, and no one is driving. So, man, it really wants me to walk in. <laughs> so if we go back and look at these cell phone networks, what do we look like to a cell phone network? Well, we look like path data. We look like... Um, various IDs checking in all the time. We've got billing IDs, as we already discussed. Well, we might look like a whole lot more to a cell phone network, right? So we also might look like all of our apps checking in, all the pictures we take, especially if their pictures are synced up to the cloud, something I will warn you not to do later. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then all those apps and all those pictures and all the data we've entered into the phone, it likes to correlate. If, if information, quote unquote, wants to be free, data likes to correlate. It likes to build these portraits. Um, and people love to connect the dots. We're in the middle of the biggest connect the dots game in possibly the universe's history, where we're all running around trying to connect all the dots we can. And everyone from marketers to governments to scientists are spending a huge amount of time collecting and correlating that data with varying levels of success. Uh, so let's, go, let's step back and also ask what the networks look like. This is the internet. It is a packet switching network. It is distri a distributed network. And keep those terms in mind because there will be a quiz every time you pick up a phone or turn on a computer. So, Let's talk about what these terms mean. These, this is, for those of you who are in IT, I know that I'm oversimplifying, and I don't want to hear about it later. <laughs> but here's three network architectures. The far one is a centralized network, the middle one is a decentralized network, and the third one is a distributed network. Just at a glance, you can kind of tell what the difference is. You know, um, a centralized network, what's an example of a centralized network? A post office. A post office? Uh, that would actually be a distributed network, I think. Rail, yes. 
<laughs> that sounds, I mean, really we should not be centralized networks, so that sounds like a terrible idea. <laughs> okay. let's, let's take another, there's a really obvious example. Well, Paris would be in a distributed network because a bunch of roads also lead other places. <laughs> How about broadcast? So from one point, all the information has to go to one point and comes out from one point. Remember, these are networks are at some level always about information. So broadcast the trains and uh, the trains that go through Buenos Aires. <laughs> Honestly, it's a little bit hard to find completely centralized networks these days, although. This is an interesting example in a bunch of the services we use, which in a way are, but we'll get back to that. Decentralized, what's the first obvious answer? I told you there'd be a quiz. The library sharing networks. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, yeah, yeah, the library sharing networks, uh, the internet. Um, what, uh, what are some other decentralized networks? The post office. The post office, <laughs> yes, got it. <laughs> Anything else? Any other decentralized networks? How about the legal system again? Especially in the US, you can see the decentralization of the networks. Um, you can see that we devolve certain things to the states, devolve further to the municipalities, so on and so forth. So legal networks obey this. Um, how about social networks? Social networks tend to be decentralized networks. You tend to have a group of friends, and then certain of your friends link you to other groups of friends. So usually when we do a social graph, we do it as a kind of um, distributed network, or, um, decentralized network, not distributed network. Um, but let's get to that. What's an example of a distributed network? Electrical grid. The electrical grid depends on where, yeah. but ish. <laughs> um, there are certainly examples <laughs> of, of distributed networks with the electrical grid. No, nope, the internet's actually a decentralized network. Um, it, it, you go to an ISP and the ISP routes you to another ISP. It is a decentralized packet switching network. Remember, there's always a quiz. Um, any other distributed networks people can think of? Let me see. Are all of you so law abiding you've never pirated anything? <laughs> it's when you dress up as Jack Sparrow. <laughs> and then download all the Pirates of the Caribbean movies off of BitTorrent. <laughs> BitTorrent is a distributed network. You are connecting to a bunch of different peers and getting pieces of those, of those movies when you're pirating pirate films. <laughs> so, um, what's another example of a distributed network? Any others that you guys can think of? Hmm? The World Wide Web. The World Wide Web, yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, the way websites connect to each other. Now, you might have noticed that it was on the internet, which I keep insisting is a decentralized network. But this is because you can lay different network architectures on top of each other. So if we look back at the example of Twitter, 